Okay, let us get started. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. All right, so this is it. The last time we are together, um, I was talking to my wife this morning as I was kind of refreshing my uh, notes, and I said, I really don't have anything to say. I feel like I've said everything I want to say. So what, what more is there today? Um, so it's going to depend on you all, <laughs> I think. You know, it could be very short if you have nothing to say. Um, of course, I'm kidding. Um, but it does today. I think today will depend on you. I think the best thing I can do is kind of go through the stuff we should go through, which is, okay, let's talk about what, what's to come first and a little bit about what happened and then kind of open it up for a discussion. Okay. I think that's the most valuable thing we can do today. So first, what's to come? Uh, you know, it's the end of the semester. Got a bunch of stuff happening. Um, on our side, we're still grading uh, lab six and lab seven. You should have them by Friday. Okay, most of them are done. Um, the, the TAs are just going through putting the last bit of touches on them and you should have the grades available to you before the exam next week, okay? The project is due on Friday, milestone three that is. Um, and those of you who want to participate in the competition, which by the way is optional, it's not at all required, we've extended it to Sunday, December 11th to give you the weekend uh, to kind of do what you want to do, okay? Now, there is no final exam in this course, but there is a midterm two, which is uh, on Tuesday, uh, 7 p.m. to 8.20 p.m. And it's similar to what we did for midterm one, okay? The strategy you should use Hopefully you've learned that from what you did on midterm one, right? It's a time constrained exam. There are some questions that are worth a lot of points and a lot of questions that aren't worth many points. So don't you know, spend, spend your time wisely on, on that. Uh, and I know that I had a lot of discussions with some of you on the strategy, but I would use the same, same strategy um, from midterm one. Any questions on what's to come? Yeah. So, yeah, it's not going to come out on day of the day. Yes, the extra credit for milestone three. That is not the competition part, but the extra optimizations part, yes, is due on Friday. Yeah. That, that new reporting for, for, the, for the PM3 report, we can increment the optimization. Yes. And do the integration later for some people. Yeah. 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 I think that is fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> okay. So that is what's to come. Now, what, what happened this semester? Oh, by, by the way, just a few notes. Um, if you can, please fill out the ISIS course evaluation. Uh, which is online, you should have gotten an email if you're in this course. Um, it's really helpful for us to continue to improve the course. So I uh, would appreciate if you could do that. And then also, I put a note on Campus Wire yesterday about a physics grad student looking for help with CUDA. And uh, that's something you're interested in. Uh, I know Marcus is looking for help. So contact him directly. It's a pretty interesting project. Okay, now, what did we do this semester? Three big things that we talked about. Um, the first big thing is really the elementary computational patterns. 
uh, that we did lab assignments on. In fact, all of them we did lab assignments on. And we kind of picked these based on what's important. Kind of looking at the space of these patterns, finding those that we can actually do with the backgrounds that you all have, and picking the ones that made sense, right? I would say this set, over the years, is the right set. So matrix multiply, convolution, clearly, right? Because linear algebra either applied to high-performance computing or to machine learning, there's no doubt that it's an uh, important set of kernels. And matrix multiply within that set is probably the predominant place we are doing computing these days. So spent a lot of time on that. We looked at different strategies for doing matrix multiply on a GPU. A close cousin of matrix multiply convolution we looked at. Right? Those are the big workhorses today. If I had to add another one, I might introduce fast Fourier transform, FFT, into that mix. Uh, and we often talk about whether we should introduce a lab that is an FFT lab into this course. Maybe, maybe not, but I think we're kind of packed with stuff that I think is really important. We'd have to throw something out. Um, so going beyond the ones that are just full of parallelism, we end up with things that are a little more difficult, a little more irregular, Nonetheless, very important. Reduction, scan, histogram. Right? And I think many of you struggled with the histogram MP, uh, in part because there's a lot of complexity that you can hit upon when you've got multiple kernels trying to handle situations that are more general. Uh, and then kind of moving on to sparse, sparse representations, right? Those patterns are a well-constructed set of patterns. If I have to kind of point to something in the course that I feel is long-lived, it's that set of patterns. Right? That's what I hope you all take away from this, that yeah, we touched on the things that are important. Okay. Now, along with that, as you kind of move away from the algorithmic bits, there is just stuff that we have to deal with that is more optimization oriented. You know, should I pick one output per thread or two output per, per, outputs per thread? Should I make the threads coarser or finer? How should I manage memory? You know, should I use a cache? Should I use shared memory? Coalescing, divergence, blah, blah, blah. Streams, right, all those things are kind of more real world effects that we looked at in the context of CUDA. So I think that's another big contribution to the course, which you really got practice in the context of the labs and the project. I mean, they're very specific things, coalescing. You know, 20 years from now, will coalescing be the same thing? Probably not. It'll have a different face to it. So it's not like it's a fundamental aspect. Well, maybe kind of it is, but not in the way we deal with it here. Okay. But it's a real world effect that you should have some practice with. And then, although we didn't really touch on the third aspect, I feel we led you to the front door, which is the programming systems around these things. I mean, we really focused on CUDA as an example. And by programming system, it's like, well, there's the compiler that you now are familiar with, but there's also the performance tools like Insight that you are now also familiar with. Um, there's the language and the driver and all the other stuff that you become very familiar with at this point. And we can apply them to all these other systems too, like HIP and Sickle. 
Okay, so if we kind of have to take a retrospective, well, that's where we are. Um, I don't know, any questions, comments about what we have done? You know, I think if I wanted to treat this as a standard course retrospective, we would kind of walk through the syllabus and pick on the major elements, but I kind of don't want to do that. I feel like that would just be a waste of time. But before we leave this, any... Yeah. You know, it's an interesting uh, question because what happens is, okay, you go from the base primitives, take one step kind of beyond, and you kind of end up in a world that's very domain specific. Okay, so if your interest is, let's say, materials modeling, okay, where you're interested in looking at the, you know, the, the atomic structure the electronic properties of different types of metals or materials or whatever they may be. Well, okay, there's a whole bunch of numerical techniques that involve grids and solving particle systems, uh, potentially using grids or free-forming particles or structures. Um, or maybe your interest is in you know, aerodynamics or fluid dynamics. But then now there's a whole realm of numerical techniques that you use that involve, uh, you know, approximations to the Navier-Stokes equations. So you kind of go off the deep end, and it becomes very niche very quickly. Okay, all these things are super interesting, by the way. Now maybe if you did a PhD in material science, yeah, you've got a bunch of numerical techniques that are very interesting to you, and you're kind of pushing the state of the art but they're very specific, involving grids or lattices or potentially taking, you know, an aircraft wing and creating these finite elements that are, you know, small little triangles that you're going to calculate all the forces on. Okay. Doesn't fit so nicely. You're going to see this in a moment. What I just said in a moment. Okay. But let me get there. It's a great question. So the point is, um, there's much more, right? It gets very interesting if that's really something you're interested in. Uh, and there's a lot of people here uh, that do, like for example, the, the, the physics grad student, that do a lot of simulation and computation, and all the numerics behind it are very unique, and they need people like you to kind of be able to do that in, in the right time scale, right? I think it was um, James Reinders last week, or on Tuesday, that was saying, you know, if you're gonna do something on a supercomputer, it's gotta finish in two weeks. It can't take two months because, I mean, it's gotta be a really important problem to take a you know, $100 million supercomputer and take it for two months, right? It just doesn't, it's not cost effective to do that. So, plus who wants to wait two months for anything, right? So you, everything's gotta be done in the right time scale. Uh, so getting things done quickly is always important. Okay, any more questions? That's a great question. Now let me kind of prime us a bit. So, okay, big blank slide. And the question I want us to discuss, okay, why did GPU computing become a thing? Like, why is it, you know, why is it taught as a course here? Why are there companies investing you know, close to 
let's say billions of dollars on this. Why is it a thing? By the way, and it's not been a thing forever, right? It only happened about 15 years ago. That's when it was introduced. So in your lifetime, it became a thing. Why now? And then the other way I would approach it is, well, if it's such a big thing, why did it take 15 years? You know, I would say that about, I don't know, within the last three years, maybe five years, it's clear that it's not going away. Because now it's not just NVIDIA, it's everyone. So there's a lot of ways we can come at this, but why now? Yeah, let's start here. I feel like it's because, in the, especially in the 80s and 90s, it felt like there was no upper bound to how fast you could make a CPU. People could just be like, let's wait for the CPU to become faster instead. But now we've kind of reached the point where we can't really do that anymore. And so the only way forward, if we want more compute, is we have to add additional devices. And so that's where the GPU comes in. Beautiful. So let me just kind of paraphrase that, because I think that is the first thing I would say is, OK, you know, there was a trend. CPUs just got faster, and Moore's Law, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And that stopped. So we had to find another way to put more power into the system in a cost-effective manner. OK. So yeah, it was the right time. But that wasn't enough. Something, a few other things had to happen. Yeah. Why? Because uh, what would make to have a device with more cores than with faster cores? Okay, so let's not let's not make a circular argument. Let's try let's try to do this carefully. So he makes a good point that okay, you know, time's moving along, we're making CPUs faster, faster. Intel is growing, right? It is the hottest company on the planet uh, at some point. CPU, 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 okay, we can't do that anymore. It's roughly 2003, 4, 5. Okay, Intel is panicking. Now, we're looking for all the possible solutions out there as to how we continue to put more performance into a unit cost, a CP or a PC or whatever. Why did GPU computing solve that problem? And it could have been other things. It could have been nothing. But somehow GPU computing solved the problem. But it took 15 years. Why? What? Tell me. OK. So let's, let's pause on that, OK? Um, one of the things I... I, I I know this is going to be a little philosophical, but let me, let me say this to you, because I think it's very important for you to realize this. Oftentimes, we, as engineers, kind of approach a problem from a technical uh, solution perspective, like, what can I solve technically? And we think the world's problems are solved because we come up with the technical solution. Right? And to some degree, that's correct. That's a, that's a very good perspective to have. Now, the other piece of it, it's the, you know, the fuel and the oxygen. The fuel being, okay, there needs, well, the oxygen being, there needs to be a technical approach to solving a problem. But the other side of it is the economics have to be right. Engineering is, cannot be viewed outside of the economics of it. All right. And I don't know that I learned that lesson, or I'm still learning that lesson. And I find it to be incredibly, just the coupling between that is just fascinating. Okay, So I'm going to tie it back to his point. So his point is, well, OK, we're at this point where CPUs can't continue to scale, and you know, dot, 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 we look into the future of 15 years and GPU computing prevails. Well, what, why? 
part of that is the economics of GPU computing. We're just right. Okay, we didn't have to invent GPUs and GPU computing. But there were already GPUs that were kind of starting to rise because of graphics. Okay. And there, were, there, was, there had already been companies created in investment leading up to that point that we're talking about, 2003, 2004, 2005, where we needed that solution. Right? So the economics were right for GPU computing is what you're saying. Right? Does that make sense? And that, by the way, is such an important thing in, in this world, that the economics are a big factor in whether a technology prevails or not. Okay, cool. So here we are again. Okay, the economics are right for GPUs. Um, the time is right because we need a solution. But there's more to it. What, what else is happening here? Cool. So what you're saying is the connectivity between multiple big pieces of silicon in the system just became much more viable, right? Yeah, I would say that what, what happened is is a consequence of, okay, we've got, a, we've got this GPU that I'm using for graphics and consumers, you know, teenagers like you all back in the day, or I, mean, I guess you weren't teenagers then, but neither was I, so there were teenagers out there that were buying graphics cards, all right? They were buying graphics cards and building up companies like NVIDIA that said, hey, we need tighter coupling and PCIe and da 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 and da 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 started to build, right? So yeah, the, the connectivity was also rising. So we're, we're not quite, there's a, another point here. There's something that's also happening in the background that's causing this to happen. Yeah. So let's take your second point, right? Yeah, there's lots of storage. Storage is becoming cheaper. Great, but more data. What does that mean? Why all of a sudden is there more data in the world? Well, the internet happened, you know, before then. But yeah, the internet has the, the 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 scaling of the internet certainly. But you know, by the way, okay, let's look at it this way: high performance computing has always been there. People have always been spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build those big supercomputers. So that hasn't changed, and that alone isn't enough to cause the GPU revolution. But something else, yeah? Is it deep learning? Deep learning is, yeah, part of it. But I maybe come to the more point here that all of a sudden, you and I, the teenagers, the adults, are generating more data that requires more data parallel processing. We're taking pictures, pictures on the internet. Uh, cameras are becoming so cheap. These sensors are becoming cheaper. The internet is filled with text. It's got data everywhere. And then machine learning can do things because there's so much data. And then GPUs, right? That, and then I would also say crypto had no small part to play in this too, right? Because they also made GPUs cheaper. 
well, you could say more expensive because, you know, yeah, whatever. Um, Yes. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, as all these pieces started to come into play, it also became very easy for people to use GPUs, right? Uh, I, I mean, here, you guys are CUDA programming, but let's, let's face it. The number of CUDA programmers in the world is small, right? Uh, so, and that's because you don't really need everybody to be a CUDA programmer. We've hidden all the complexity around frameworks. Right? We have to. Even though GPUs are powering self-driving cars, which they are, there aren't people programming GPUs. Um, right? the, the, the amount of code that we have to write, thanks to things like what I put on the previous slide. Well, you know, at the end of the day, there's really just a small set of patterns that we need to run on these things, thankfully. Okay, so we can kind of hide all this stuff behind the toolkits. Okay, if it's, so here we are, right? Let's just to recap, uh, we need a solution. Our appetite for computing power has not at all abated. Well, there's a, a bunch of paths we can potentially go, you know, sure, quantum, uh, photonic computing, um, multi-core. By the way, we, we tried multi-core, right? Multi-core is also another path out of, so why did multi-core not succeed and GPU computing succeed? And it, again, comes back to there is so much data that kind of this, explosion of data that happened in part because of mobile computing and consumerization of things like computer vision and image processing where you just need lots of compute. And graphics, right? There's, of course, you know, uh, gaming drives a lot of this. Uh, and virtual reality, which, you know, the potential of that has also driven this. So lots of data that consumers needed throughput the fact that consumers needed throughput meant that, well, everybody on the chain, even the high performance people, could benefit because the economics of GPUs, everything just, everything just worked out. Well, why not multi core? Why didn't multi core kind of succeed in the same way? And which, by the way, uh, multi core, I think, has been pretty much a disaster. Um, why? By the way, this is a fascinating question. Yeah. I could do the same thing, right? We could take CUDA. Okay, I got two threads. Go run them on a multi core. But I can program a multi core using CUDA. Right, so CUDA is not as much of a mess, right? So fine, you're, you're okay programming CUDA. Why not create a CUDA-like thing for multi-core? Yeah? Yeah, you're saying the, the, the right thing, but I'm going to rephrase it. And what you're saying is, those are big, beefy things to be running these very fine grain threads, right? So if I really wanted to write, uh, create a core to run these fine grain, low synchronization threads that aren't synchronizing, I'm certainly not designing another x86 core to do that. In fact, there are so many threads in this new world with lots of data that I want more threads running concurrently as opposed to a few threads running concurrently, right? So the multi-core design point 
just wasn't the right design point. If that makes sense. I mean, just to put a finer point on it, multi-core, right? Everybody's designing multi-core, right? If you buy an x86 today, it's a multi-core. It's still useful to have a multi-core for many types of applications. If you're Amazon building a cloud server or a cloud, uh, uh, um, you know, a data center with lots of cloud resources, multi-core is your right design point because you've got you know, lots of different jobs, lots of different virtual machines that are using those cores to do different things. They're not synchronizing, really. But you get a lot more throughput. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there's a lot of that involved as well. Okay, now, why did it take 15 years? If this was such the right thing to do, why wasn't it that, okay, 2008, CUDA is, in, or 2007 CUDA is introduced? Why by 2010 isn't it everywhere? Yeah? Yeah, you know, uh, one of the more disappointing things, okay, so I said economics, like, okay, we're engineers, so a technical solution, I got the great technical solution, it should just go. And economics often holds things back, that's part of it. Uh, but there's another kind of, kind of drag that kind of holds technology back. Um, and I, I don't know if I can put a specific finger on it like economics as to the thing that holds it back, but there's a human-oriented time constant associated with technology propagation. And you know, I've been thinking about it and kind of trying to put a theory around it, but I don't know that I have one yet. Um, but things take time. So specifically here, what is kind of that time constant, what's, what's it due to? In part, you know, if we look historically, there were events that kind of propelled it forward, like AlexNet. But what, what's fundamentally that drag in this case? What's contributing to that drag? There's a there's an adoption time like every you know there's, there's bell curves everywhere, you know there are people that are the early adopters that will see something ah CUDA and start using it, and there are the people in the middle I'm sure they have a name I just don't remember what they are, uh, and then there are the laggards, right so you know, kind of even upon you know, companies kind of follow the same distribution as to how long they take to adopt something that's clearly the right thing to do. So you kind of 
take all these time constants in, and also you factor in the fact that, well, the, the early adopters are kind of suffering all the pains of the technology, right? You know who you are, by the way. Some of you are these early adopters. And you know how messy it can be to take something that's new and start using it, right? CUDA is horrible in the first few incarnations. There's no tools. There's no libraries. But if you're a laggard, hey, it takes you just a few months to take your big application and benefit from having a CUDA version of it, right? So, yeah, was it worthwhile waiting? Sure, it just took me a few months. But you came in year 15 as opposed to in year one. But these time constants, by the way, are, like economics, a fundamental part of really doing things in the real world. Yeah. Um, at which point on the bell curve would you say should I test the game? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's, I mean, that's another brilliant economic investigation we can do, right? From a re return on investment perspective, when do you get in? Yeah. I don't know if I, uh, yeah. Let me kind of tr turn this one around. Moore's Law, right? We all know we've heard so many different variations of Moore's Law. Let me throw one out there, okay? And it goes something like this, that the uh, chip density of transistors doubles every 18 months, right? And so it's something, it's a rate, right? Over 18 months. What is that 18 months? What's happening in those 18 months? Is it like there are scientists kind of in a room trying to create a fundamental breakthrough on something? What, what's happening in those 18 months? Yeah. Great, very nice answer, right? I think I would kind of summarize what you're saying is, it's not just a group of scientists in a room trying to break through on an equation, but it's multiple companies with equipment and assembly processes and manufacturing lines where everything has to change. Okay, uh, but why I said this, why I even brought it up, is because it's another example of where all of these time constants come into play. <coughs> There's a lot of human factors involved. And um, as engineers, you know, if you're trying to do something in the world, you gotta really understand these time constants because they're all part of the solution. So, okay. Now, let's come back to the world of GPU computing. Now, one of the big pieces that I walk away from with CUDA that wasn't there prior to CUDA is something that you mentioned. Um, you know, going back to the world of parallel computing, and I, in fact, I remember this vividly because we here, you know, right, the, the 2003, four time frame. People were very concerned. The computing industry was very concerned that if we're gonna move into multi-core, that these big applications would, you know, like, what were they back then? I don't know. Microsoft Word, <laughs> I don't know what they were. There was a bunch of them, right? Hundreds of them, thousands of them that would need to take advantage of the multi-core world in order for these advances to continue. So how are we gonna take these big pieces of software and make them work on a two-core system or a four-core system? Right. 
eight core system. Da, 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 da. To the point where Microsoft and Intel and the big software vendors started to invest around parallel computing. Parallel computing had been around for a long time, even prior to that. And what we had learned <coughs> is that it's hard. Right? If you're going to take two threads, and those two threads have to interact somehow, right? So what do I mean by that? Is okay, I've got you know thread one here and thread two. And thread one is somehow interacting with thread two. For example, maybe thread one needs to read a value that's coming from thread two. And then maybe thread one writes a value that thread two needs, right? So in effect, if you're taking a big application like uh, Microsoft Word, um, you know, these kind of situations, and you're trying to figure out how to write two threads. I want to run one on one core and this one on the other core. Boy, this problem just becomes a nightmare. To the point where people started to invest lots of money. Uh, in fact, we had a big research center here at the time, uh, funded by Intel and Microsoft, where we had dozens of graduate students trying to figure out the best way to create multi-threaded applications that can run on multiple cores. Where you have situations like race conditions and deadlocks and time spent waiting for thread two to finish generating this value so thread one doesn't have to wait for it anymore. Okay, so the systems, the programming systems were just very, very complicated and there were hundreds of them, you know. OpenMP, uh, POSIX threads, uh, uh, you know, there's just one after the other, another. Um, and it wasn't clear what the industry was going to do. And it was also a nightmare for programmers to do these things. So what happened is, well, by the way, one model amongst all of these was this idea of bulk synchronous. And you may not realize it, but we've been kind of using that model throughout the semester here. And the idea behind bulk synchronous is I fire off a bunch of threads, okay? And all of those threads do not talk to each other. They don't synchronize. They're independent of each other. And the only time I synchronize is when they all finish. Boy, how simple is that compared to a world where I've got these, you know, big chunky threads that are always trying to communicate with each other because thread one needs a value generated by thread two. Well, no, those threads do not talk to each other. They can talk to each other, but they have to wait there until they're all done. That is, so, and in fact, at the time, um, I recall I was running a company at GIA, uh, the CTO of GIA, where this is the model we ultimately came to. Also, NVIDIA did. And when we talked about it, people said, oh, that's too simple. Uh, you know, what you need is you need threads to be able to talk to each other because there's no way you're going to ever create applications that don't have threads that are talking to each other. I always used to use an argument that went like this. We're not interested in building two threads or four threads or eight threads. We're interested in building a thousand threads. And if you're going to have a thousand threads talk to each other, good luck to you. Our threads don't talk to each other. 
And my premise was, if you've got parallelism, you've got a lot of parallelism. If you don't have a lot of parallelism, don't bother. And I, well, I was right, and it turned out the, the NVIDIA people were the, seeing the world the same way, and we were both right. And look at where we are today. Right? So all these messy programming models, they're still there, but they're not dominant. Right? What is dominant and it's the simple idea that if I'm going to create a parallel thread, it's, it's, it's a parallel. I'm just going to fire it and forget about it. It's going to go. It's going to do its thing. And we're going to really not synchronize these things. Right? We had to introduce a few exceptions, right? Where do we introduce exceptions? Yeah. Sync threads, return memory. Sync threads. Right? So, yeah, it turns out we can't get away with it because of things like shared memory. But we all know that sync threads is expensive and painful. And it's painful because we often forget to put it in, right? Our program doesn't work. And, but that's my point, that the multi-core parallelism just never worked because you're always missing sync threads or the sync thread equivalent. OK. Uh, but where we succeed is, hey, I've just got you know 100 million pixels I need to process. And yeah, just do each one independently. Go at it. Questions, comments? Yeah? Um, <laughs> we created physics. Okay, the, in fact, the word physics. Um, was done by my friend Michael Steele, who was the VP of marketing at Agia. Um, I remember that day vividly. But as, you know, if anything, like when I, you know, come across physics in NVIDIA marketing, I always think, well, of everything we did, that's the one thing that still lives. But the whole physics, right? Our company, Agia, was we created the hardware, the architecture. But we also created the physics middleware, which was a whole set of, in fact, we had a team in Switzerland um, that was doing most of the numerics uh, running on our chip. And that team is still with NVIDIA to this day. So it's, it's pretty interesting. And then the, the, Chris Lamb, who was actually one of my students, who was leading our compiler effort, um, you know, to take the, the, the output of the software team in Switzerland and have it run well on our hardware, right? That was our compiler and tools. He is now the VP of, of CUDA at NVIDIA. So I, I take those two things as, hey, you know, we did a GIA, and now that GIA legacy is still running at NVIDIA. Okay. Um, okay. So now, here's where we are. Um, uh, if we take a look at the CUDA ecosystem at NVIDIA, uh, there's a bunch of hardware, right? If, I mean, I don't even keep track of what NVIDIA sells anymore because it changes so fast that I, I just don't waste my, my brain cells on that. But what we see is uh, there's an expansion beyond just C, C++. Right? If you wanted to program NVIDIA GPUs for GPU compute, you can approach it from so many different angles. We did it in the, from, a, from a C, C++ perspective. Um, in fact, one of NVIDIA's latest efforts is a version of Python that has direct um, CUDA bindings in it. So um, 
Now, so the, the NVIDIA is investing in people who want to engage with GPU computing by providing additional language support. You don't have to be just a C, C++ programmer to, to, to engage. But the point I really want to make is if we take a look at where the libraries are, like if you wanted to take your application or your code and have it work as a GPU accelerated application, you don't have to go and write CUDA. In fact, very few people do that. That was my point earlier. There aren't that many CUDA programmers in the world. But there are a lot of people who take advantage of GPU computing. And that's because after 15 years of, of development, you can use, if you're interested in writing linear algebra, CU blots or CU sparse. All those libraries are already there for you. Want to do a matrix multiply? Don't write, you know, lab, lab two. Don't, you don't need to do that. You can just go and use the right uh, CUDA call in your C++ code, your Fortran code, your Python code, whatever it may be. Right, and let's take a look at those libraries. CU plus. Matrix multiply, that's primarily what it is. CU sparse, sparse matrix multiply. That's primarily what it is. CU DNN, that's our project, right? Your project, the project you're doing is very much mirrored in what you might find in CU DNN. I wouldn't go and run CUDNN on your code, by the way, because you'll probably get depressed that your code runs so slow. Um, uh, so, but that's what it is. CUFFT, right? If I had to add another kernel to the ones that we looked at, so FFT would probably, DFT would be it. Um, but you said other than DFT, right? I don't know, uh, because all the other ones I'm not so sure uh, you know yeah I think they get domain specific um, oh and by the way there's physics right so physics is a uh, GPU accelerated physics library physics library okay so today if you are going to engage as a as, as a programmer well that's probably where you would engage. You know, if you're doing machine learning, by the way, it's even popped up a level, right? You just use uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever your favorite framework is, and that's automatically GPU accelerated because down in its guts, it calls one of these libraries. Okay, if you look at the NVIDIA, or if you take a look at the AMD world, same thing. Hardware is down here. The programming system is here. The HIP, we all know, is CUDA, right? Um, so the language support, although it's not quite as rich as the NVIDIA, it'll get there, right? They'll, they'll eventually get Python support, MATLAB support. For, I think they already have Fortran support. But you kind of see that in order for a company to build a viable ecosystem, you've got to build a huge amount of software beyond the silicon. And that's really why you know, I asked you, why did it take 15 years? Well, it just takes a long time to build all this stuff, right? And the more you build, the more people adopt in it one fine day, you're a thing. Right, so you can see, in terms of math libraries, FFT, sparse, blahs, eigen, kind of the same thing. Makes sense. Any questions? Again, if I brought up an Intel slide, it would look the same. So hey, if you're going to do a chip startup, 
this, this might be interesting. Um, you might think, okay, great. You know, I've got five friends with me. We've got this great idea for a chip. Um, the chip is going to be an accelerator. It's going to attach to G, uh, CPUs. It's going to be better than a GPU because we're going to do more threads and blah, blah, blah. This is going to be better. Well, you spend uh, a year designing the chip. Two years later, you've got the chip. It's ready. You're ready to sell it. But no one wants to buy it because they really need all this. Right? So it's, uh, the odd thing is designing a chip and bringing that chip to a market requires a huge amount of software, as we found out with the GR. It wasn't good enough to just introduce a physics accelerator, but we had to acquire a team in Switzerland to build all the libraries around that accelerator. Cool? Okay. Um, maybe we'll end here. Um, and again, I think you all know this. <laughs> But it's kind of nice to see it on a graph um, and to think about what might happen next, right? So uh, let's kind of decode this really quickly, right? The number of logical cores. And I think in this case, we're talking about CPU cores because it doesn't really go significantly beyond two to, 10 to the 2. Okay. And... We have power here, and this is, I guess, single chip power, because what we see is that flattening out over here due to Denard scaling. Actually, no, power is always limited by thermal, so you know, about 100 watts is about all you can do in terms of uh, uh, moving that much hot air off the chip and heat off the chip. Uh, and then what we see is the frequency flattening out kind of um, in that 2003 time frame. And that's all due to this issue of Denard scaling that we talked about at the beginning of the semester, right? That 2003, 4, 5 time point where we couldn't just continue to make CPUs faster. I mean, a real thing, right? We see it here from the perspective of physics. And what resulted is single thread performance, well, it's flattening out. It's not increasing at the same rate that it used to. But if we look at all these golden triangles there, Moore's law. <laughs> Moore's law is still kicking. It's probably not going to kick much longer, but it's still kicking. So what do we do, right? What, what happened in that very interesting time gap where 2003 till now, right? In part, it's this, this, this GPU acceleration. But yeah, maybe I'll come back to this chip here. I, I think there's a little more going on than just GPUs, right? This here is the Apple A14 Bionic chip. I know. At this point, 200 million of these chips out in the world? That's insane, 200 million chips. I don't know that I, you can point to any other place where you've got 200 million chips out in the wild, right? This may be one of the the highest volume chips out there. <coughs> well, there's a CPU here. In fact, there's two CPUs, right, this blue region. And there's a GPU there, right, of course, because we've got 3D graphics happening on a mobile device. But there's all this other stuff happening. Um, like this neural processing unit. What's it doing? Uh, 
probably face ID. But what's it doing from a computational perspective? Matrix multiply. Really, that's all it's doing. It's doing your project right here. Um, you could run that on a GPU. Clearly, we do that now. But the reason, well, why not run it on the GPU? Yeah? Probably more power efficient and faster to do it on its own hardware. And oh, by the way, we have so many transistors, we don't know what to do with them. They're free. They are, right? Yeah, I guess Apple could have said, well, bionic chip is only this big. Okay, now the battery drain on Face ID is a little longer. Whatever other stuff Apple is doing on the NPU, yeah, whatever. The cost of adding this much silicon, just add it and do all this stuff because our phones will be better as a result. But fundamentally, it's matrix multiply. And using an idea called, I don't know that it actually uses a systolic array. I don't actually know what this does. Um, but it could use a systolic array because that's one way to do a matrix multiply. What do you think this does? Convolutions. Okay, right, here we go, the two big patterns. Again, we could do those on the GPU, but hey, the more efficient to do them here. I mean, it's convolutions plus other stuff, but the big thing that it's doing is convolutions and histogramming. By the way, I uh, was recently involved on a, a project to help design a radar chip and um, at the end of the day, that chip, lots of convolutions and lots of histograms. And again, the architecture of these chips looks very similar. CPU to do the you know, weird OSE kind of code, keep things organized. But then we've got these things we need to do that We've got chip space. Go and do them there because we're going to get such a big bang for the buck. We might as well put them there. Okay. So why did I put this up? And the reason is, if, I, if we have to think about what's coming right next, right? So we kind of went from the, the single core era to kind of the throughput computing era. So what's next? That is what's next, right? That you create these chips, like the Bionic, with CPU, got a bunch of transistors, because hey, look, we got tons of transistors there. Start to create these domain-specific accelerators to go and do the more efficient but high-throughput work that we need to do. So if, we, if that's the realm here, how do you think we're going to program all that stuff? Again, because software has to be there. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, and how are you writing those libraries? You're going to hire people like you, exactly. And the programming model is going to appear oddly similar to CUDA, right? Because it just works. And we now have people like you that at least understand what that paradigm is, right? Yeah. Eventually, you know, accelerators in. How, how are we going to deal with all that divergence? 
Yeah, so I guess your point is a general purpose thread can do everything. A image processing core can only do a certain set of things, right? Uh, that's right. Um, you kind of have to make a gamble that for the time frame in which the chip will be important, that the things I put in hardware are going to be the things that are important, right? Because let's say Apple releases the A14. Um, and yeah, everybody's doing Face ID. But the very next month, everybody stops doing Face ID. And now this piece of silicon is just dead, right? It's not useful to anyone, but they're paying you know, extra $2 for it, whatever it might be. Yeah, it, it, what's the likelihood of that? It depends on what you're accelerating. So you think carefully, right? You've got to think carefully. You just can't accelerate any piece of code, right? In fact, I think this is a hard problem. I don't mean to belittle it. It is a hard problem. What do you accelerate and how do you accelerate it? I'll give you a quick example. Okay. Um, there's, again, a company I'm uh, consulting for has a new algorithm for a signal processing they're doing. Okay, they're processing a set of signals. We're going to do it this way. And boy, it takes so much compute to do it that way, but it really is the right way to do it for us. So how do we take that and get it done in the time we have for the computation? And the struggle we have, we're having, is we know what that computation is. Here is the linear algebraic form for the computation we need to do. Should we just take that form and build it in hardware? Well, what if we're wrong? What if our engineers six months from now say, you know, no, we kind of need to insert another term in this, or there's another step we need to do beyond just this equation? If we already built the silicon to do that equation as is, we're going to be wrong. We could take a general purpose DSP core and say, we're going to do it on that thing. And we probably aren't going to get the best performance per watt in that case, right? So how do we do it? I, I don't know that we have an answer. Uh, this is just a very important question in this new realm. Uh, how do you design these accelerators? OK. So I think I've said a lot, hopefully, you found this stimulating. Um, any questions, comments, feedback? Yeah. Well, everything is an SOC. In fact, uh, it's gone beyond SOC. In fact, the next realm, what's really interesting now, uh, James Reinders mentioned it in his guest lecture on Tuesday. So what is an SOC? Well, SOC is this. It's a system on a chip. This is an SOC, right? Apple decided, hey, we're going to put all this stuff on our chip because it's the right thing to do after our engineering analysis. So that's, you know, that's kind of the way it's done. And, but there's a new change that's happening, and that might change things dramatically. It has to do with this new type of interconnect called UCIE, a Universal uh, Chiplet Interconnect Express. Uh, it's PCI Express, but it's oriented for chiplets. Okay, and if you don't know what a chiplet is, imagine we took this NPU and we just sawed it off. Then, you know, we're not going to put it on this die. We're going to Take that NPU, and we're going to put it on a separate die that we might buy from some other third party, right? Hey, this company out there makes the best systolic array technology. Theirs is way better than anything we can design, so we're going to buy it from them. And the coupling between the two 
is this interface, this UCIE interface. And we're just going to, when we package the chip together, we can kind of glue them next to each other and just run wires between them that are you know, actually on the substrate, what we call the interposer. And that just kind of takes those two die that are physically close together and connects them in the right way. And this connection uh, is a high-speed connection, clearly, but it's, the protocol is UCIE. So as long as Apple builds enough UCIE interfaces, it's plug and play these things together. I think that is super exciting. Because it means now you can start to concentrate value within the companies that are building things that are very specific uh, and very targeted towards you know, these, these kinds of accelerations. So uh, kind of what's exciting for me is in this new realm, this accelerator realm, in fact, my addition here is, is really the accelerator era because hey, we can start plugging and playing these things together in ways we couldn't do before. Probably, I mean, you know, if this happens, okay, where it's not one monolithic die, but many die that are connected together in a, you know, 2D, 2.5D, 3D way, there will be evolution on the interconnect. People, you know, will come up with new ways of connecting these things, better protocols. Uh, but PCIe, you know, started as, as PCI, PCI. It started as whatever, HEXP. I don't even know what it was before PCI. Um, so, but it's all part of a continuum in my mind. So UCIE will go to UCIE 2.0. We'll go to something else. We'll go to something else. Continue to improve, of course. Okay. All right. So I think we're near the end of time here. Um, thank you so much. It's been a great semester for me. Um, good luck on your exams, and I hope that I see you all around. Um, I know some of you are graduating, but if you're around, you know, don't hesitate to stop by. Keep in touch. Okay, thank you. <laughs>